thank you very much, everybody, for uh, joining the uh, EBTS today. And um, and I'm thrilled to be able to to ask to have organised this talk about Waltham Place with the gardeners of Waltham Place. I visited ten years ago, and I I was stunned by the garden, and and thrilled by the philosophy behind it. You know, where they're trying to turn a, a wilderness from the garden and turn it into a wilderness of sorts. So um, the talk's going to be split up into three sections. Um, I think Nikki is going to start and talk about the history of Waltham Place. And then Louisa will talk about some of the philosophy and how, how they grow the plants. And then Andre will, will finish off, I believe. So I think now we can, um, Nikki, if you're ready. Uh, thank you very much. I shall hand right. over to the gardeners of Waltham Place. My name's Nikki. I am the education officer here at Waltham Place and um, I'm joined today by Louisa who is one of our gardeners. She's going to be um, giving you a little guided tour around two of our gardens. We do have many more but we thought these two would be of the most interest to you um, and also by Andre who's our estate manager um, and he's going to talk to you at the end about our um, biodynamic philosophy and um, how we garden without the aid of chemicals, um, fertilizers and pesticides and um, about how we tackle pests and diseases. Um, and you've already mentioned the box moth. Um, I do our moth surveys for my sins um, with a moth trap. And I must admit, I do feed the box moths to the chickens, but no other moths are harmed in the making of our estate. Um, so this is an aerial shot of Waltham Place. We are a 220 acre organic and biodynamic farm. And we're um, just outside London between Slough and Maidenhead. So you can see the yellow outline of the estate here. Um, we sit right up against the M4 motorway, which you can see cutting right through the picture there. And we're under the Heathrow flight path. So although it feels like a, a sort of organic oasis when you're on the farm, we are really close to some big infrastructure. There's been a farm at Waltham Place for over a thousand years. We were first mentioned in documents dating back to 940 AD. And um, in 1060, the land was divided and um, Waltham Place um, was given as part of a parcel of land to the Chertsey Abbey um, to provide for the monks' households, food and anything else that they needed. Then in 1537, during the dissolution of the monasteries, Waltham Place actually passed into more private hands. And since then, it's been sold many times over the last few centuries and eventually ended up in the hands of the Oppenheimer family. This lovely couple is um, Carlotta and Louis Oppenheimer, and they came to Waltham Place in 1910. Um, Louis and his family owned um, De Beers Diamonds. And so they needed a, a property that was near enough to London for him to go to work in the city, um, but with something that would keep Carlotta entertained. So if I could have the next slide, Andre. Now, this is the, uh, now Carlotta was, um, she was highly intelligent. I think today she would have definitely um, had a, a job and she would have been very good at it. But back then, um, as an Edwardian housewife of her standing, she wouldn't have been allowed to work. And so she put her considerable um, intellect to writing poetry, which was published, and also to redesigning the gardens at Walton Place. So try and keep this photograph in your minds as we go on through the talk, because this is the square garden that she designed. Um, she designed it in, a, in an Italian style. So there was lots of stone, lots of clean lines. Um, some of the features that you see in this photograph, the sundial, the fountain, the bench, um, the big wrought iron gates at the back, they are still in the gardens today, perhaps not in the same location, but they can still be found today. Now, Colotta, we know, was very um, influenced by an up and coming garden designer called Percy Kane. And in the 1920s, Percy drew this plan, um, which was actually a new back entrance for the estate. And it would have come up from the Waltham Road um, through the fields and a little block of woodland behind the house. Um, for some reason, this plan was never implemented. 
And although um, many people think that Percy did it, did um, build some of the gardens at Walton Place, for the family's 100th anniversary, some research by Reading University proved that um, it was actually Carlotta herself who made some of the greatest changes at Walton Place, no doubt under Percy's influence, but she actually designed the gardens herself. I love this photograph because it shows the back of the main house and literally the hay, hay meadow runs up to the back of the terrace. I have never seen Waltham like this because Carlotta designs our iconic long borders which reach all the way down to link the main house to the meadows and the woodland beyond. So you will see again scenes similar to this later in the talk but with these beautiful iconic um, tall yew hedges um, that form our long borders. Now Carlotta she did view the woodlands as an extension of the garden so we believe this is a picture of what we know as Green Walk. The thatched hut is still there um, and there are fields actually to either side of this walkway, but it takes you right down um, to the edge of the deciduous woodland. Um, it is a magnificent place and this is the type of thing that Carlotta did. She made inroads into the woodlands, she put little thatched huts to guide the eye and lead you along. No doubt she would have sheltered there in the rain when she was enjoying the gardens and she ran a team of 14 gardeners. So she was um, a prodigious gardener. Now Carlotta and her husband moved away from Waltham um, around the time of the Second World War and Waltham was left their son Raymond. As you can see from this picture, Raymond is no gardener. His passions were golf and bull terriers, which he bred for crofts. And um, although he was very good at both of those hobbies, his impact on the gardens was quite profound. This is Jerry and Titch, um, two of Waltham's gardeners, back when um, people would have a job for life. So they both spent their entire working lives here. And you can see that under Raymond's instruction, the gardens have been put to grass. It's quite shocking. This is that lovely Italian square garden of Carlotta's and it is completely grassed over. So um, not good for the life of this garden. The winds of change blew again in 1984 when Raymond died and having no children of his own, he left the garden and the house to um, his nephew, Nicky Oppenheimer. So this is Drilly and Nicky Oppenheimer who have owned Waltham since 1984. Um, when they inherited, what they found was um, a farm and gardens that had been split in half by the M4 motorway. So they sold off the land on the far side of the motorway and Strilly instructed that Waltham should be certified organic. So we've been certified organic since 1984. Um, that meant no chemicals of any sort in the farm or, or in the gardens and we had to learn to do things differently. She also instructed that the gardens be restored and so new plantings were implemented right across the site. But as a, as a very seasoned traveller, Strilly always found that she leaned more towards naturalistic gardens. And as a keen conservationist, she wanted to blur those edges between garden and a sort of nature reserve type thing. And so I'm going to stop there and hand over to Louisa, who will take you on a tour through two of our gardens to try and give you an idea of what Strilly achieved. Thank you, Nikki. Hello, everyone. My name's Louisa, and I'm an ornamental gardener here at Waltham. Welcome to the Gardens of Waltham. Um, the inspiration for the gardens came into being as a result of Strilly Oppenheimer's visit to the Creona Gardens of Henk Gerritsen in 1999, and as such, she found a kindred spirit. The philosophy he embraces is of a naturalistic approach where there are no boundaries between garden and nature, thus creating an oasis of life where insects, animals and plants live harmoniously together. One of Hank's beliefs was that 
maintenance should never degenerate into a battle against nature. So I'm now going to show you some pictures of our gardens here, starting with um, the square garden. This is one of my personal favorite gardens to work in. You see here the wonderful informal part planting. This is probably a picture taken possibly June, July. And um, as you can see, it's, um, it's, it's very naturalistic in its style. All the wall gardens date from the 17th century. The square garden is about an acre in size and was a vegetable garden in the 17th century. In the early 20th century, Carla Otten Oppenheimer had it changed to an ornamental garden in the Italian style. The basic structure of cruciform and perimeter paths of York stone, the central pergola and fountain, the elegant formal pond and the pavilion all date from that time. Her son Raymond Oppenheimer left the structure and or ornamentation intact, but as elsewhere, grasped the garden over. In 2000, Henk Gerritsen began the task of changing the garden yet again. He came up with a design of a low caterpillar hedge of box that would snake across the garden and beneath the vergola, creating a visual connection from one side to the other. It also echoes the undulating yew hedges of the long border. Um, beyond the box hedge, is the self-sown grass steeper tenuissima, which likes to seed itself in the Yorkstone path, creating a wonderful visual effect as you walk around the perimeter of the garden. On the warmer side, gravel was laid for drought resistant planting. A four meter wide strip of lawn follows the curve of the hedge which was supposedly to prevent the ground elder from crossing to the less robust gravel plantings. In addition to the perennials, a variety of grasses and some self-seeding annuals, this area contains numerous South African bulbs, such as diorama, together with more tender species in the old raised beds along the north wall. At the very back of this garden, in a very old planter, is a shrub called Melianthus major, which is also known as the honey bush. And this shrub is endemic to South Africa. Here you see the lovely diorama, otherwise known as angel's fishing rod. This plant is increasing in numbers year after year and always makes a good and good talk, talking point with visitors. It also looks really good with grasses. The area south of the hedge was planted with robust perennials like Persicaria and grasses such as Calamagrostis that would be able to compete with the ground elder which was also part of the planting. Persicaria polymorpha, otherwise known as giant fleece flower, which is the creamy flower in the picture, when that reaches a certain age, it can sucker. As the plants were put in in 2001, I think that that is what is going on here as some of the suckers are running under the path. I am hoping to retire before it reaches the potager garden, which is the next garden. Right, um, the garden demonstrates um, that you can have a naturalistic planting within a strong layout and a historic structure. 
Um, this particular, particular picture shows the box tree caterpillar damage. It is showing quite badly on this side of the garden. It first started in the potager garden. Biodynamic spray preparations are used to try to rectify the problem. And Andre is going to talk about this. We also use manual intervention where Tim collects the caterpillars by hand, puts them in a tin and then feeds them to the chickens. The hedges are trimmed once a year in the summer. As with the other gardens of the estate, it has a flowering peak, but there is no one time that it is best to see it. The picture changes constantly through the year. In the southeast corner, wooden steps lead up to a hide, which provides a striking view of the park and the woodland beyond the wall and of the contrasting patterns of square garden and the potager below. Grasses, perennials and flower heads are only cut down late winter and spring, as a garden can be beautiful and interesting even in the depth of winter. And now we're going to move on to another garden. This is the Long Borders. This was designed by Percy Kane for Carlotta Oppenheimer. It's a 70 metre long double border. The beds lay grassed over for many years until Strilly Oppenheimer had them replanted in classic style. The soil at that time was heavy clay, so the borders were double dug and much bindweed and ground elder removed. Mainly fairly predator proof plants were put in, such as Cornus, Romnia, and Hellebores. This is the view from the terrace. Strilly's ultimate plan was to plant more naturalistic borders into which the resident weeds would be incorporated. In 2002, Hank Gerritsen had the yew hedges clipped into cloud formation. Over the years, the mature trees have grown considerably and are now encroaching on the hedge, which is adversely affecting it, unfortunately. A naturalistic planting of robust perennials was chosen for the borders plus a fair proportion of ornamental grasses to maintain volume and texture in winter. The grass edges are trimmed frequently in summer as a contrast to the informal beds. Hank established a new formality within the borders by means of a series of semicircles of clip beach. Visualizing the bindweed as a series of snowy towers along the length of the border in summer, he made weed beds within the circles of beach with obelisks at the center that would provide climbing support. The snowy towers have not materialized because the bindweed, preferring the support of other plants, refused to grow up the tripods. Instead, fountains of Anamanthale lessonia have been planted as the central feature within the beach circles. So now we have a monoculture planting within the D beds with the beach semicircles of yew hedge in the background, adding interest and formation to the borders. In this picture, you can see the bindweed climbing over the yew hedge, lots of marjoram in the front, which the butterflies absolutely love. One of the beds on the slightly shadier side, one can see some hemlock at the back of the border. We also leave in some burdock plants. Grass is again a main feature. At the front of the border is Alcamilla, together with a plant that does exceptionally well, which is Aruncus Horatio. There is no barrier to deter the wildlife from entering this garden. The deer and rabbits continue to nibble and dig holes once the gardeners have gone home. It's worth mentioning 
that this garden is always a spectacle to behold when it is alight with butterflies, another sign of the wonderful natural environment we have here at Waltham. Of course, we have many other lovely gardens to see, but I hope this has given you a little insight into not just a garden, but a beautiful nature reserve as well. Thank you. Thank you, Louisa. Uh, hello, good afternoon to all. Um, I will speak a little bit about um, the philosophy behind of, of what we do, uh, but also the, the practices, and hopefully I will be able to evidence some of the, the yeah, of our achievements. So I'm sure you're all familiar with this logo on the left. As Nikki mentioned, we've been organic certified since 1984. Um, as part of an organic farm, we don't use any chemicals, no artificial fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, fungicides, and so on. But it also has a, a, a deep impact in terms of an, our animal welfare, in terms of the uh, animal housing, space available for animals, animal diet, and so on. This logo on the right is the Demeter logo, which is certified by dynamic farming. So we've been certified by dynamic since early 2000s. And, and, and what does that mean? Is that we're trying, to, some people call it the organic plus. What we're trying to do is to create truly a self-sustaining organism in which all the different aspects of the state support each other. Yeah, so for instance, uh, we, we have livestock, we have uh, the livestock are really important for the cycle of fertility of the farm. Part of our aim is to avoid buying anything in from the outside. So that's why that question around the seaweed, as we don't have the sea here, we use natural tea instead. So we're trying to create all the fertility necessary from within our means. On the other hand, we produce all the animal feed um, within the state again. So it's really trying to create the self-sustaining organism in which everything, so every activity supports each other. And again, there's a real impact in terms of animal welfare because the land, uh, the stock density will depend on what the land can sustain. So that's again, a really fine balance there that is quite interesting to, to work with. I will just start mentioning, because I cannot mention soil management. This is really something that soil life is, is key to what we do. I like to say it's the framework of everything else. And when I was in agricultural college, college a few, well, quite a few years back, uh, I remember the conversation was always around chemistry of the soil, was around structure, was around cultivation. So that, that dominated the conversation around soil management. And the last 10 years has been really exciting to learn about soil life and the whole role of microorganisms. And we're learning more, soil science is developing so much and it's such, quite an exciting time. In terms of what we do, the key aspect is to feed the soil and not the plant. Yeah, so in contrast to, to a more conventional approach, which would perhaps to consider what plants one is growing uh, and then create a mineral budget and use then artificial fertilizers, which are highly soluble to, to uh, give the plants what they need. And with these highly soluble fertilizers, the plant, they don't need to work very hard to search for their nourishment and so on. So what we're using is very slow release um, compost so the compost is produced on the farm. Composting is one of our key activities. I'm, I love composting. I, I, you can get me talking about composting for days and it can be a bit obsessive. So I have to apologize for that. But I think it's absolutely amazing the fact that we can bring all the, these materials that in some cases are considered a waste product, combine them in a certain way, transform it and create something that is totally unique. You know, something that is really adding organic matter to the soil, is really building up this fertility because our long-term goal really is this living soil with lasting fertility for the future generations. That's what we are trying to achieve uh, with what we do. Via composting and other activities as well, such as mulching, we do a lot of mulching across the state, including the ornamental gardens. And for that, we use a big variety of materials from straw, from our own cereals to hay, which is perhaps less ideal because of the weed seeds, um, but hay we have abundance of. So sometimes we end up using uh, leaf mold, 
um, kitchen compost, uh, what else, wood chipping. So we use a big variety of things because one of the key aspects of soil management is it stays covered. So if the soil is covered as much as possible throughout the year with active roots, the soil will be healthy. So that's what we are trying to achieve. This picture that you see here is a horticulture production. So it's from the kitchen garden. And this is a no dig trial. So we're playing also with this concept of no dig. We also have a market garden and, and a wide range of horticultural uh, examples as well. And then uh, something else we use quite extensively is the horn manure preparation. Basically, that is fermented cow dung that's being treated in a very specific way. So um, we use that as a prebiotic and as a probiotic for the soil. Again, really, every time we cultivate, every time we fertilize, every time we bring compost or when we manure the soil, uh, we use the whole manure in order to encourage microorganism activity. So this is something that is was very important. And nowadays, carbon gardening is a very trendy topic and everyone is talking about it. And this is part of being part of our practice uh, since uh, 100 years which is really building up organic matter in the soil uh, uh, to sequestering carbon, either uh, by biomass production with green manures and so on. So we've been working quite act actively with that. At Waltham, three years ago, we've done a whole set of soil samples. This year, we're gonna repeat them all. And I'll hopefully by the end of the year, I'll be able to say, you know, the impact that we are having in terms of carbon sequestration uh, as, as a general activity in the state. Just to illustrate, those are our composting bays, just to sort of show a little bit of the scale that we are working with. Again, we're producing all the fertility needs for the 220 acres from within the state. Of course, not everything is uh, applied compost, but the ornamental gardens, they all have a layer of compost each year, depending on the garden and depending on what the soil tests are telling us, it will be farmyard manure or will be garden compost or leaf mold. We are on a chalky base, so it's quite, a, quite an alkaline soil. So leaf mold is something that is gold for us as well. Um, and just to celebrate these this, this creatures, I don't expect you to have one of those in your gardens, but those are our working oxen, that's Jean Ludi. And we work with the, with the cattle. Well, we mix the cattle and the sheep together. We call it a flurb, which is a flock and a herd combined and we move in a, a, a holistic grazing. So we, they are, each day we move the electric fencing. So to allow them to, to trample one area, to manure one area, to uh, really graze that area properly before moving to the next one to encourage uh, more biodiversity, less compaction in the soil. So this is part of our general approach. So livestock is really also crucial to, to what we do at Waltham. So more specifically to the topic of our conversation today, I wanted to share some of the strategies for prevention and treatment of fungal diseases. I'll focus specifically on, on, on box blight and just share some of the practices that we are doing. Prevention is always better than treatment in organic terms. Every time we have to start treating something, we are uh, uh, in problems. Um, so of course, soil management, as I explained to you, mulching and fertility. Um, with the box uh, hedges, we tend to use leaf mold um, to, in order to, one, to really keep the soil covered, but also the leaf mold is less nutritious than the manure, for instance. We don't want to over fertilize because that could also encourage uh, fungal diseases. So it's very important to strike a right balance there. And in the next slides, I'll be showing you some of these teas that we are making, the compost tea, the biodynamic preparation, I mentioned to you the horn manure, which is that prebiotic and probiotic for the soil. But we also use a, a, a field spray preparation, which is called horn silica, which is made out of quartz and it's applied directly into the plants. Yeah, so that really, again, with the silica content, we want to, to encourage the hardening of the leaves to perhaps to make the plant more resistant to fungal activity, but also other, other pests. And then I will cover all of the other topics in the following slides. So the compost tea is something we use all the time. So this is a little flow form, um, which I'll play it. It's a, it's a bit of a video. I'll, I'll play it in a minute. Otherwise, the noise will disturb uh, my talking. But we use compost tea uh, not as a fertilizer, but again, as a garden tonic. 
because it's not very nutritious, it's not too rich. So what we do, we use um, a water the tank, a water deposit, and we will fill a jute bag with manure, with uh, nettles, with comfrey, uh, depending on the garden and depending on what other soil tests are telling us, we will use a little bit of basalt, so a little bit of rock dust. Uh, we have some gardens that really magnesium is deficient in the early summer, or perhaps add a few uh, teaspoons of Epsom salts and molasses, and really to get uh, 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 that going, we will let it brew for a few days, uh, aerobically, so air, again, is really important. And again, the, the, the concept is simulate root development, simulate plant health, microorganisms in the soil. Yeah, so the compost tea is one of our key um, tools with the box blight prevention and, 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 and control. Because in, my, in a very simplistic way, I think the fungi has got a role in nature, which is to break down, which is to decompose, which is to break down decaying matter of things that are not vigorous, things that are weak. Um, so in a way, by encouraging soil activity and soil life, uh, we are allowing our plants to be as vigorous as they can possibly be. And hopefully that will also uh, uh, stop the, 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 the development of diseases. So this is just the flow form working. So you can see it's a nice, there's a little pump there. And we, we keep that going for two or three days. You don't need to have one of those. You can just have a little aquarium pump or something like this, just to keep air going into your compost tea. And we use that directly into the soil, not too often. So for instance, with the box blight, we do one application in spring directly into the soil and one application in the, in the summer. So yeah. Natto tea is, is something we're making now. Now is the time to make it. There's, there's um, a lot of growth in natto at the moment and they're very vigorous and we want to do it before they start flowering and seeding because to make teas and then spread the seeds all over your garden, we're not encouraging that either. Yeah, we love natto. It's a fantastic plant, uh, but I'm not encouraging that you're going to uh, 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 spread all over your garden. It's very rich in nitrogen but also in other micronutrients. So we use very sparingly um, with, the, with, the, with the box heads, with the U heads, we use very sparingly, but we use as a foliar feed. Again, apply directly into the soil, can be used as a compost activator, um, also as a pest repellent. Immediately after making the tea, especially good with aphids, this, it works quite well with aphids. So we harvest the nettle, put it in a container, cover it with water, leave it till it smells real bad. So a few weeks and it's smelling rotten, then it's good to use. Um, we dilute that, one part of that uh, natto tea to 10 parts of water, and we use in average three times over the growing season uh, um, with the different um, yeah, hedges on site. Equisitin arvensis, again, a really another invasive plant that many people uh, uh, don't like it, don't like to have it in their gardens. So horsetail, really rich in silica. Uh, we, we, we make a tea more in a common general sense. So we'll, we'll harvest a plant, we'll dry it as a whole plant, we'll boil, uh, we'll dilute one to five, and we apply that every two weeks. That we do uh, in our box hedges, we do on the new hedges, we do in the tomatoes, we do in the potatoes, all the crops that are more susceptible to fungal diseases. We use that every two weeks. And then again, another uh, aspect of the, the biodynamic garden, we work with the, with the moon phases as much as possible. So the, the horse tail application works specifically well uh, closer to a full moon, which a fungal activity is enhanced uh, around that time. Um, garden biodiversity for us is extremely important. So biodiversity is one of our key tools to prevent pests and diseases. So one of the main aspects to ensure that the habitat is available all year round. So if you notice that picture that Louisa showed from the square garden with the summer growth still standing there in late winter. So that's a habitat as well as a food source for wildlife. So this is something that is really crucial, crucial to us. Uh, and that we can all do in our small gardens. Now, one of our colleagues is saying, no, in the UK alone, it's 23 million home gardens. You can imagine, you know, the potential impact of, of what a biodiversity reserve we could become if we're all uh, working perhaps more, more in tune with nature. So 
careful with the mowing, ensuring that there are no use of chemicals, ensuring the diversity of plants. Boundaries, hedgerows are fantastic for that, you know, to really bring those beneficial insects into your garden. Um, look at the wider context, look what your neighbors are doing, look at the region which your garden is in, just to sort of try to bring complementary habitats, try to get a, a perception of, of that area and see how you can do your parts to enhance. Um, we avoid uh, the use of hybrids, ornamental hybrids, because despite of the beauty of uh, a lot of them, they're extremely attractive and very beautiful, but some of the ornamental hybrids in the breeding process, um, something was, was lost or something was added. So we have some of these double petals that sometimes invertebrates cannot access because of the morphology of the flower or has affected the nectar content, has affected the pollen content. So more and more research has been indicating that the use of ornamental F1s can have also an impact on, on uh, invertebrates. So this is something to consider. And we make sure that our gardens are full of nectar and pollen rich plants uh, and in succession. So that's again, something that is really quite important. We, uh, just to mention, I, I, I gathered by the beginning of the conversation that quite a lot of you are already garden organically. Of course, um, a, lot of, a lot of people use fungicide uh, in order to prevent box blight or to control box blight. Europe is the major market for fungicide in the world. So again, it, it's a statement to our climate. So it's a real serious uh, consideration. Fungicides, they have an accumulative effect. So they build up in the soil and we see that on the vineyards uh, uh, in, in, yeah, yes, where fungicides or copper sulfates are using extensively. So there's a, a accumulative effect of that. And we know now there's an impact on invertebrates, vertebrates, soil life, microorganisms, and, uh, and it's a threat to aquatic ecosystems. So again, you know, if as much as possible, we can, we can work with different methods, we would certainly, we certainly do at Waltham, we certainly advocate that. And to just to evidence that some of our efforts, just so those are the numbers in terms of wildlife surveys that are taking place uh, within the state. So we have currently 25 species of butterfly, 60, 60, 665 species of moths, 73 bird species, eight bat species, 56 spiders, and 61 bees. And that number grows each year. This is one of the tasks that Nikki does, so it's bringing people together to survey, but also administrate all this data collection, which on the other hand, really, we're trying to make sure it also informs more and more what we do, how we manage the gardens. So yeah, it's really quite exciting to see, to see those results. Um, in terms of, then just to summarize our box blight management, in the spring, we'll do the mulching with leaf mode, we'll do one compost tea application, two applications of the horn manure, nettle tea if needed. And then in the summer, um, caterpillar, the box free moth caterpillar control, um, we will clip the hedges, one application of compost tea, an application of horn silica, and then working with the horsetail tea application every two weeks. Um, that's sort of our general strategy. And I would like just to show some pictures evidencing uh, how, how is that working for us? Because I must say it's very labor intensive, uh, even though it's just a few applications, you know, it's proving itself quite labor intensive. Sometimes to the point, we, even though we're seeing the results, I wonder, you know, is box, what's the future for, for box in our garden? So we'll be looking to alternatives, shall we not? Shall we keep doing these? How efficient that is? So it's a big question mark for us at the moment. But this picture is from 2010. So where, you know, there's no sight of uh, box blight there, so it's looking fantastic. Then 2015, bang, five years after, it's looking like this to the point is that what we're going to do, even Strilly uh, suggested at the time, I wasn't here, but uh, my colleagues have related to me, perhaps we just leave the dead standing box uh, hedge there, you know, it will serve as a structure. Of course, that's not a long-term solution, but that's one of the considerations at the time. And then 2018, uh, I'm afraid I didn't have a summer picture to show you, but that's that very hedge that you saw on the previous picture. We started the treatment, of course, removing diseased material, the general hygiene considerations, which uh, it, uh, are very important for that practice. 
Um, but just as an, uh, uh, removing the disease material, re being very careful with uh, fallen leaves and so on, cutting back in some areas, but then working with that program that I just showed you. That's 2019. So we start to see already some good results there. Again, so that very edge, good recovery in that space. Um, yes, sorry, that's the other side of the, the square garden. That's a picture when we already started the treatment, but pretty much this, I'm afraid I, had, I, I didn't have a picture prior to the treatment, which is a big mistake. If you want to evidence, you've got to show the problem. But here we can already see a huge improvement in comparison to, to what was there before. And again, you know, that's um, 2020 really starting to show some considerable results in, in, in what we're doing. Yeah. So here we are, 2020 again, and really starting to come together quite, quite nicely. But as I mentioned, very intensive. So, you know, just in terms of our, to so summarize our general tips, soil management, good composting, healthy stock, the biodynamic preparations, compost tea, the natural teas that we make, nettle, comfrey, horsetail, and a lot of diversity. So those are our sort of key tips. And this is my last slide. And just to highlight some of our design features and you know some of the principles that are guiding our decision making is the first one, which is also our slogan, working with nature rather than against it. Of course, we try to be as efficient as we can, to be really economic in our efforts in order for everything that we do, if we're working with nature, um, the, our efforts will multiply. Yeah, so it's always a fine balance. How much control do I want to have? How much I want to step back and let nature take its place? There's not a recipe book. There's not a one size fits all solution. It's really through observation, thinking and perception, especially, especially observation and perception. I think they're really important nowadays. You know, it's wonderful that we have all this technology available to us and internet and our little phones but it really is moving us away from being able to be present in one place, you know? So go to your gardens, follow a bee, follow a bird, see what's happening, leave the phone in the house, take the time to really observe. And, and that in a way is what should inform our decision-making. And I don't know about you, but personally, a lot of my decision-making process is done by walking the gardens. So it's not so much, thinking just by walking, breathing, almost like a meditative uh, uh, effort, you know, one, the, 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 the information, what needs to happen and the decision-making process will be living in the garden. And it's again, it's a dialogue with nature. I always like to say that it, this time now more than ever, this dialogue with nature, we need to have it not only as gardeners, but whatever job, whatever activity, we need to start finding that balance once again, reconnecting with nature and gardens are a wonderful tool to do that. Diversity is key for health and resilience. It doesn't need to say anymore. We see a lot of the time, the solution is in the problem itself. So, you know, again, a, a typical example of, of diversity acting, working on our, on our behalf, you know, a lot of the time we see a specific pest coming to the gardens, before panicking two, three days after, because of the ecological infrastructure that we have, the predators will come and there is balance. Things will fall into balance. Some of those teas that I showed you, the nettle, the horsetail, those plants are seen as invasive. They're seen as a problem. Whilst for us, they are solutions for many of our practices. Again, designing from pattern to detail. So looking at a holistic picture before working out the detail, before um, making any, any, any decisions and integrate and adapt to change. This is something that last year proved as necessary as ever. The integration, we find it very, I, I personally, I, I really enjoy to have a broad range of skills, a broad range of people, a real diversity of cultures and people as well or, and expertise. So for instance, the, the example of conservation, you know, as a gardener, as a farmer, I always knew how to promote soil diversity. I always knew how to do those things, but I could not identify any of those creatures that were flying in my garden, you know. We over time start learning, but at Walsham, we really also rely with our relationship to the national, to the local wildlife groups, to the amateur experts that are working with us. 
and yeah, adapting to change. You know, one very small example I can give you last year, uh, it, it, everything, all our plans and business ideas, we had to just tear it away and start again. So our farm shop was closed. We had to change a whole business model, which proved amazing. You know, we started a box scheme, which was really successful, was a real eye opener uh, uh, for the ways we were managing things. And we could only do that because we had the people, we had the skills, but we were, yeah, ready to adapt to change. So that's what I wanted to share with you today. And yeah, thank you very much. Andre, Louisa and Nikki, thank you very much. I'm going to give you a round of applause from here. And, uh, and it was, we do have a couple of questions, but um, and I, what I'll do, I'm going to go through the ones on the chat. And then I think uh, I've just seen Andrew Marsden's raised his hand. So I'll get to you, Andrew, and anyone else. Um, but thank you very much. It was a real pleasure. And, um, and I love those borders, you know, and the boxwoods. And, and they're really fantastic. Um, the first thing... Uh, I wanted to ask, I'll start with one question, is about the moths. There were 665 moths, Nikki. You you spend a lot of evenings out in the garden counting each one, or is that well, a large amount for a, a British garden? Or? Um, it's a fair amount. Yeah, yeah, it is a fair amount. We've got a third of um, the UK's um, macro moths, so the UK's big moths, a third of them are here. Um, and we've got about a fifth of the UK's total moth populations. We've been surveying for moths since 2002, and I've been involved with the boys from the Berkshire Moth Club, who are our volunteers, since 2013, <laughs> when we started um, a we started a yearly moth night, so members of the public could come in. But I have to say, since lockdown. Um, I've actually been running a trap myself because the boys couldn't come. <laughs> it, was my, it was my idea of hell having to do it myself and identify them myself. But I enjoyed it so much. I've slightly got addicted and Andre's actually <laughs> bought me a moth trap for the estate, a nice fancy one. And um, yeah, so Bernard and I, Bernard's one of my moth men. He and I are trying to survey in locations we haven't done before because we feel that we've found all the species in the central locations so we need to go further afield because the more diversity of location the more moths we're going to find so i am hooked i'm now a moth woman i know yeah. the Berkshire moth yes the Berkshire moth group and there are Berkshire, there are moth groups all over the country so Ring them up. They love having new sites to go to. If you want to know what's in your garden, just ask them and they will come. <laughs> Nick, it's like something out of a sketch show, but I think it's wonderful that people... Yeah. Have to it. And it yeah. was like said at the end that the part of being in the garden, you're looking and having to observe, and and that's a really important thing. And and then, you know, you a lot of people, I would say a lot of young people who maybe have lost their jobs in the last year, they're told to find their passion for a job. But actually, just by being somewhere and really being there, you can become passionate about it. And I think that's um, you know really illustrating what Andre says and and your your new uh, Berkshire Moths Women's Club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, women are very underrepresented in the moth world. It is all men. I don't know why. <laughs> boys, I'd say boys. I think boys. Yeah. Are so, but I like it but uh, that's great so what I'm going to do is um, I've got a couple to um, a couple of questions here which have come in so first of all is do the chickens like the BTM boxwood moth caterpillars yes yes <laughs> yes, <laughs> yeah. yes. <laughs> I think that yeah. is I think it's the only insect yeah. we feed them yeah. we don't particularly yeah. We don't collect slugs and snails and things yeah. like that. It's only box moth. Yeah. Yeah. Amazing. And yeah. they're all gone. Well, I, I feel that anyone living close to you might be popping around with theirs very shortly. <laughs> they're <laughs> they're welcome. Very fat chickens when you <laughs> when you're finished. <laughs> so excellent. Um, and then I've got, uh, you showed a picture, I think, um, Louise, you showed a picture of the yew hedge and the canopy is going across the yew hedge. Um, is there plans to kind of uh, lift that to give the yew hedge a chance or because I know Strilly is very much about Yes, um, Strilly as you know doesn't like too much intervention. Um, I don't know if Andres made Strilly aware of the problem we have with the yew hedge. Have you, does she know Andre about 
she hasn't been over for quite some time actually yeah but we, yeah. yeah we find it's it's drying out and it's it's suffering isn't it yeah yeah, yeah. so she, she's aware uh yeah. we 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 are at the moment monitoring a little for for a little longer before uh making any 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 decisions but yeah we're keeping we're keeping her informed and and, and hopefully we'll we will intervene at some point um even you know there are possi many possibilities there we can pull out some of those species we can copy some of those species so there are there are alternatives that we can we can work with will you chip will you chip any of the prunes if you were to remove these these um plants back and then add them to the compost heap or do you tend to leave them as piles habitat um piles or all of those Aaron. so depending depending what they are so if it's generally speaking if for instance if trees fall down at Wolfen, if they're not blocking a the path they will stay where they are if they're blocking a the path we will do a combined approach you know so we will leave some of it uh, uh, as, as a habitat. So we would make a stack and leave it as habitat. If depending on the size of the timber or if it's, you know, sending a big oak, we might plank some of it for, 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 uh, for timber. Uh, we also have a shredder that we add to the compost. Yeah. So depending, again, there's no recipe. It will depend on what it is and where it is. And then, but everything will be used somehow within the state. Fantastic. Um, excellent. And then I've got, uh, I've got a couple more. Someone has asked number of staff and volunteers, or is, is it just you three? <laughs> <laughs> it feels like it sometimes. <laughs> we um, are 20, but yeah. not all full time. So Louisa, for instance, part time, we have three or four part time people. Uh, and, and not on the gardens, on the ornamental gardens, we're two and a half. Really? isn't it so it's seven acres more or less of ornamental gardens which again evidence what mm -hmm. louisa was saying earlier you know what hank's uh, part of hank's uh, credo hank's idea that we should not be always fighting with the garden should you know this naturalistic designs they should also hold their ground and not to be so uh, intensive so it's two mm -hmm. and a half you know, the sheer amount of planting in the borders you know and they're very robust perennials that they're certainly elbowing their way above the weeds it looked like so mm. Yeah. Particularly with um, the one in the square garden, which is Persicaria polymorpha. Um, I, I'm in my 17th year now at Waltham. And when I first came, it was quite neat, small, compact, almost shrub size plants. And in sort of 21 years, it's got into enormous, absolutely huge um enormous sort of tree-like plants that just keep moving more and more towards the path so i think it's just one to watch that one i yeah. think it's That's got a it. few oh, tricks to it <laughs> yeah. i'm quite worried yeah. about, nightmares about this plant <laughs> do you know this plant uh, I, I i have seen it yeah oh yes the a car is a part of the knotweed family so it's uh yeah <laughs> so not 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 quite as bad so um but yeah. Yeah, no, i love i love that very much so um yeah we've had some lovely messages as well for a lovely people looking to come and visit which i think is great um camilla would like to know how to join the Berkshire moth club please is that i think it's the Berkshire moth boys isn't it? <laughs> it's it's actually called the Berkshire moth group camilla and you'll find them just online and I'm sure they'd love to um, welcome you. I don't know if they're meeting on Zoom or how they're doing it in lockdown. Um, my boys have actually left the Berkshire Moth Group now and they're sort of their own little moth group. And they do us, they do one of our neighbouring farms and um, they've got a few public sites. But they, they really like private gardens and estates because I... It's not true of the whole moth world, but the gentlemen I work with are fairly elderly now. Um, they know so much and they're very keen to pass on their knowledge. But because they're older, they don't like going to public sites anymore because they'll stay out till three in the morning in the summer. They'd rather be on a private site where they feel safe. So I'm sure if you contact the Berkshire Moth Group, you'll find people who will guide you and help you and welcome you and teach you. Well, I've got a couple more questions, but I know Andrew's got his hand up. 
you you mentioned problems or you know, problems um issues with deer and rabbits and things uh interestingly just about an hour before you started so he said to me i said i don't think we're going to do anything this year about getting new new plants in because the deer and rabbit has everything and you you seem to have a policy obviously of tolerance of, of these things and so my, i've got two questions one, one is what's your choice of planting which which is pretty well resistant to deer and rabbits which makes your garden look so attractive presumably the, the perennials that you were, you were you were showing and secondly in the area where you've got to have um, um, plants approved from from um, the deer and rabbits like your vegetable gardens what's your policy there do you just exclude them um, presumably they're in walled gardens where you can use uh, you know, use fences or what have you so how how, how do you welcome the uh, the what we would call pests into the garden Good question. Good question. Hello, Andrew. Hi there. Hi. Well, we we Hank actually had a whole list of plants that were mainly predator-proof plants, such as cornus, romnia, hellebores. Um, he put in quite a few. We used to have. They've died out now, but we actually had delphiniums um uh aruncus mm -hmm. as well that they they don't touch those plants we have nifophias as well um but uh we we still find they come into the garden and and dig they just dig around the plants now and burrow make burrows <laughs> down um in between the plants but they don't seem to be actually eating what's in the long borders um so there is quite a long list of that's only just a few of the plants that he he put in but i have got quite an extensive list of what is it is it published um it we could get the information to you via darren i'm sure yeah thank what you the list was um it's also so, and, and i think also once the plants are established they're less likely to nibble them then it's when they're young and newly yeah. Planted, yeah. newly planted i think once they're established they're not so tempting um and as regards the kitchen garden um we have at the back of the garden we have it's all fenced and at the back of the kitchen garden, we have a gate and on top of the gate was another piece of wood, another sort of um, barrier, if you like, because the deer used to jump over the gate. So they made another barrier higher to put on top of the gate to stop them. But I heard recently that they've actually jumped the wood <coughs> barrier as well, would you believe? And they they were seen, or they would they did get in. Um, yeah. But basically, the wall gardens um, all, would all have gates, which would stop them actually getting into the wall gardens. Whereas long borders is open um, to the um, woodland beyond, so we have no means of um, you know of stopping them, preventing them from yeah. coming borders but we certainly would in the other gardens and the kitchen garden as well although as have I said you, yeah go on have you had any success with natural deterrents things like lion dung and um, <laughs> uh, human <laughs> hair all these other things no. we've never tried it <laughs> have you you've got a problem with them have you yeah we've yeah, tried all yeah. sorts of things we've just got to the stage where we're not going to have any pretty flowers or vegetables <laughs> and, and try and just have a, a structured garden very much like yours with with lots of um structural planting like box and rosemary yes. and things i was going to say yes. that's why you're in the uh, boxwood and tapery society andrew <laughs> yeah. 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 That, that sounds like a real evolution you come out of lockdown and it's an evolution of your garden <laughs> yeah. we can um, i will speak to nikki and louise yes we can get get a list of 
what originally was in the long borders for you. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Yeah. Um, if you have a look at Hank Gerritsen's book, uh, Essay on Gardening, which I'm a massive fan of, I absolutely, I must have read about seven times, Essay on Gardening. And um, I read it so much because it's, it's very funny, but quite dense as well. So you, you kind of think, what, what's going on? And you have to read it again and again to pick up another tip. It's a wonderful little book. So have a look. And that, that will talk a bit about the Waltham Place as well. So yeah. uh, cool. Well, good luck, Andrew. Right, I've got a couple more questions for you, if that's all right. Um, do you mulch box clippings? What do you do with the boxwood? Depends. If it's if it's um, diseased, we will we will burn it. Yeah. If it's diseased, we'll burn. If not, it could go part of the compost, and we we'll shred and make it part of the compost. But at this time, we pretty much. We, I'm afraid we're burning everything. And what do you do about watering? Oh, we depends. Again, we have a borehole, so we have our own source of water. The annual garden, so the kitchen garden and so on, we have sprinklers and irrigation system. But the idea is that for the perennial gardens that we don't water. So the, the square garden, what you think, I don't think we water at all, isn't it? <laughs> no, uh, so, we don't. Unless no. there's anything newly planted, we water. Otherwise, we don't water. Yeah. 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 Yes, I watched. I walked yesterday through Chelmsford, and a, a guy had a sort of two meter by two meter bit of lawn, and he's only been there for years. And he was he had the sprinkler on it at seven o'clock, and I thought, really <laughs> 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 <I did. laughs> he'd be out there today mowing it. I thought, how to create work in your garden? That's what that was. So, um, yeah, no, I think, uh, and obviously because you're mulching, you're trapping any water yeah. in the soil anyway. Yeah. And, and with the exactly with the compost in it, so, at, so it's improving the water retention. Uh, we are addressing the, the watering situation in the perennial gardens. With the annual gardens, of course, it's, it's a different matter. <laughs> Excellent. So we've got the um, uh, Lindsay, Lindsay Bain has asked, and, uh, and I pull up bucketfuls of horsetail every week, so happy to find something to do with it. <laughs> Is the tea made best from fresh <laughs> horsetail, or do you have to dilute it to use it? Good question, Lindsay. Lindsay, you dry it and then make the tea, yeah, and, and better dilute it to use it. So one to five, it's a good dilution for the, for the horsetail. You're going to have a lovely patio full of horsetail drying in the sunshine, Lindsay. <laughs> Won't, that be... <laughs> Won't that be nice? Is that all right? No, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, yeah, and again, lots of thanks. And um, uh, Camilla, do you have a natural deterrent for badgers? And she also suggests, Andrew, deer do not like the nasty cheap soap, so you can hang that up in fruit string bags in the garden. So your, Lindsay can have horsetail drying all over her garden, and Andrew, you can have some nasty soap strung up all around, all right? <laughs> We're making your gardens beautiful one step at a time here, aren't we? <laughs> but the badger is, um, I do, I'll try to say the name in English, correct me please, Darren, citronelle, citronelle oil? Citronella. Oh, that, would, that would work. It's probably a citrus oil, citronelle. Would citronelle, that yeah. A citronelle oil um, is, is, if applied with some frequency, okay. it, it may deter the badges. It's not that effective, but you can try, Camilla. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good luck with that one, Camilla. <laughs> I suggest a lynx or a wolf. Yeah. <laughs> very natural, very yeah. natural. <laughs> Um, excellent. So yeah, and again, lots of people very, very uh, enjoyed the talk very much and lots of people look forward to visiting. And um, Maureen has asked, um, Andre, you spoke about no dig in the garden. What happens in the fields? Do you still plough? Maureen, depends. Again, we, we, um, we plough a, a little bit. So out of the 220 acres, we plough five this year, you know, so it's, we avoid as much as possible. But in some situations, if we want to start from a uh, convert to per, something that was in permanent pasture for cereal production, because we do a little bit of cereal production, we, we do heritage grains, then the plowing is done. But we avoid as much as possible. So another trial that we're doing to try to stop plowing in certain places. So for instance, in the market garden, so this, the pictures that I showed you are the kitchen garden. The kitchen garden is small, it's one acre, and it's 
sort of within the walled garden uh, 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 area. And there we do the more intensive crops, you know, things that need daily care and things that are more tender and so on. And then in the market garden, we'll do the potatoes, the onions, and you know, your main, your main crops. So at the moment, for instance, the market garden last year, we've done a trial of a no dig potato. So we grew potatoes in, in, in hay. So we didn't dig them at all. And we did the same with the courgettes and the pumpkins. And all this year, we just used the mower on top of that material that was there. I mean, it's incredible, the quality of the soil. And we're gonna grow the tomatoes on top of that. So we're trying as much as possible to minimize plowing, but we are not completely out of it. I, I know in some organic farms, they're now um, doing a very shallow plow. Yes. Um, is that something that you, you plan to, to make? Yeah, we, 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 we tend to plow quite shallowly as well. Um, but again, there, were, there was 90% of the time we do that, but there was one of the fields this year that we had to, to go to this, your normal depth just because of what was there in the condition. But again, we, we try to avoid you know, and, and we integrate the livestock as part of that strategy. So for instance, we are this market garden, which I mentioned to you, we're only using a quarter of that field. So um, at the moment, the other, the other three quarters, we have a rotation to, we have the pigs, we have the Tamworth pigs coming in, eating the couch grass and working that piece of land. And it's followed by a crop of winter rye, which again competes really well with the couch grass and then potato. So again, really trying to minimize uh, that sort of intensive cultivation as much as possible. Mm. Yeah, I was interested to hear you say that you um, keep the cattle in, in an area for a short time and then move them on. That's, that's very much the philosophy in New Zealand farming now, isn't yes. it? Yeah, in Africa, New Zealand, that approach come, came from, from Africa, from Zimbabwe more specifically. So Alan Savory, uh, by observing you know, the, the herbivores in the in the in, in the natural environment that they came up with this grazing system yeah. Yeah. which at first people thought it was not going to be suitable for yes. the uk the uk um uh, weather but you know for us it's working really well i have to yes. say yeah thank you pleasure thank you maureen okay, thank you well that's um yeah and i guess the tamworth pigs do a little bit of tilling for you as well andre when you leave them in that <laughs> so I'm going to, so I think we've got, um, so you can see a talk about that, um, the shallow tilling. It's Alan Savory, there's a TED talk he does about that. So if you want to learn a little bit more um, and really interesting. And there was a place called Village Farm in Devon that were doing that um, a couple of years ago, but that, that yeah, you, can, you might find something online about that. But um, I think, yeah, lots of people saying thank you very much. And then probably the last question, when is the garden open? The gardens, um, we open for general tours on um, Wednesday the 26th of May um, and if, if people wanted a private garden tour with a, a sort of big group, a garden club, that opens on Tuesday the 25th of May. But we are having a new website built as we speak and it's supposed to be open at the beginning of May. Andre and I are both praying for that date um, so that we can actually do online bookings. So we're not actually open for bookings for garden tours yet, but check the website um, from the 1st of May because hopefully it will be the new website with the online booking. Um, we also have a weekly newsletter which is on the, you can access it from the homepage of our current website, or you can email, email me um, through that link and sign up for it. And we do communicate with our customers via that weekly newsletter about all our openings and all of the wildlife and things that go on here at Waltham, including the Mothmen and Batmen, Spidermen, all my men <laughs> and um and all the things that happen in the gardens here all i all that really remains for me to say is thank you very much guys and i i give you a round of applause and it was much much appreciated so thank you all right thank, thank, you. You. thank you thank you guys thank, thank you. you and christopher bye bye. Is, there, is there anything you need to say before we we end the meeting and and head off no, I'd just like to say on behalf of EBTS, thank you, Darren, for arranging this and uh, to uh, Nikki, Louisa and Andre for taking the time to show us around uh, the garden. I can't wait to get over there as soon as we're out of lockdown.
thank you very much and thank you to everyone who uh, joined thank Please. you thank you for the opportunity thank you. thank you right thank you very much everybody uh, i think we're ending so stay safe and we'll see you all again soon i hope take care bye